Thanks for the Jamdagni and uh, thanks for those nice words. It's not easy to hear such words when you are head of computer center at IIT Bombay. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, anyway, so any, any any such thing that comes by me by my way, I'll be happy to take. Um, yeah, so I'm okay. I'm I have a couple of other hats also. I I am the convener for something called the Bharti Center for Communication, and I also run the networking lab at IIT Bombay. <coughs> okay, uh, the other thing that I want to start off is to apologize uh, sort of marginally because I will probably be sounding a slightly shrill note uh, when I when I say what I have to say. I am not going to talk about uh, research, but I am going to talk more about the HR perspective from an HR perspective in some sense in terms of the kind of people that we ought to be looking for and what I believe is happening in that sphere. So this is not about my personal research which uh, which is uh, just, uh, just so that I, I, I sort of uh, put things in perspective as to where I come from. So I'll just talk about me, myself, and IITB. I don't know if you're familiar with this movie called Me, Myself, and Irene. That's sort of a takeoff from that. Um, anyway, so my research interest is in networking, networked, and computer systems. So I'm in the E department there, which is about 65 strong and probably one of the largest in India. Uh, the CSE department uh, has more than 40 faculty. I think they're probably hitting 45 now. Our previous director used to say that this was the largest computer science department in Asia. Uh, <coughs> And uh, just to say also the kind of people we see as students, about 70 of the top 100 JE students come to IIT Bombay. And many of them, most of them, uh, they're, okay, there's a non-trivial fraction of them that want to go to computer science, but a fairly large percentage also choose EE, although they could have gotten whatever else they wanted. They make EE by choice. Uh, so so in, in, in terms of the quality of students, we see fairly high quality students. And also to put the research activity in the department of two, as to what I see in, into some perspective, so we graduate about 60 undergraduates every day. And uh, I think probably I should make that almost 150 to 200 master students every year and about 25 PhDs. A large fraction of these 25 PhDs actually come from microelectronics, which is primarily an experimental activity in IIT. Um, and the CSE department, just to again say where, where what I see, uh, the CSE department graduates about the same number of UGs and MTECs, uh, but maybe a significantly smaller number of PhDs. Uh, because of the experimental work at uh, in the microelectronics side of things, so the number of graduating PhDs is much larger in the EE department. Okay, uh, here is what I want to give the outline. So there's a wish list which I'm going to elaborate upon a little bit, and then I want to sort of see two, there are sort of two landmarks that an that an engineering student in India has, uh, especially an engineering student who wants to do research. One is the JE landmark, which is typically taken after the 12th standard. Roughly 17 to 18 year olds take that exam, and then at the end of the engineering. If they want to do a postgraduate in India, they usually take something called the gate exam. I'll elaborate on these things. So, so it typically it is people who take these exams that eventually want to come to come to research in India. So I want to sort of understand what is happening on that based on some data. So much of this data, part of it is sort of not available to the public, part is from public domain. And to the best of my knowledge, such an analysis has not been done on the data. So this is sort of the first time I'm presenting this, this kind of a, this kind of an analysis of the data. Um, so 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 I'll take the wish list and then after giving you some inputs based on this data or my thoughts based on this data, I'm going to revisit that wish list and see where we stand. And then a little bit, so, so what we normally do in IIT is when we, when we admit students for masters and PhD, we actually conduct an interview of these students. So we roughly know where they stand and, and we, we, we are looking at a fairly large pool. For example, the total number of applications for PhD program this year is about 400 plus. 
and the total number we admit is very very small we don't have the, at the, the number is small not because we don't have seats many times it's also because the quality is 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 is, is quite suspect so i want to sort of give you a few personal anecdotes on that to just to tell you how things are and uh, again those are anecdotes and those are not statistical data so the previous one is more based on data so this is more of more from personal anecdotes and i'll give some concluding remarks based on that <coughs> Okay, here is the wish list that I that I want to start off with, and much of this is uh, is much of these calculations are from P J Narayanan, who is the dean R and D at Triple ID in Hyderabad. Um, so this was presented by him at a talk recently uh, at, at at a what is called a f I think they called it a faculty summit, uh, which was sponsored by ACM and MSR, that is Microsoft Research in Delhi, uh, where we sat down together to understand the I mean understand how to generate more research and more PhD students out of India. Okay, just to give you again, uh, just the numbers are about 500,000 students register, enter a computer science related curriculum in India at the undergraduate level. Okay. So one assumption that one can fairly make is about 1 to 2 percent of these are inquiring minds and want to know. I don't know if you're familiar with that slogan. That's the slogan from National Enquirer. Okay, that's a tabloid from the US. Many of you may not want to read it, but it's a tabloid nevertheless. But I like the slogan, inquiring minds want to know. So we'll assume that these one to two percent of these uh, of these five hundred thousand students want to do research. I mean, th that's not that's not an unreasonable assumption. So this means that if we are sort of doing a decent job, we can probably generate about five to ten thousand PhD students or PhDs every year. Okay, that's probably again uh, not unreasonable. <coughs> so and this uh, so this will probably exploit the demographic demographic dividend, which is probably a favorite buzzword buzzword of most of our policymakers today. And uh, this demographic dividend can be exploited to provide a very strong base towards uh, research in computer in computing and computer science. Okay, so those calculations are from PGNR. Now, what I'm going to do is to look at uh, how these five to ten thousand, where do these things, where do these people come from? Okay, so just a little bit, a few words about JEE. Most of you might know, but uh, for those of you who don't know, so JEE is probably the most glamorous examination system in India. Okay. It has spawned a $10 billion coaching industry. It's, I'm not making this up. This is a fairly, I mean, you, you, we can back these numbers up. So it's a $10 billion coaching industry to train about 1 million students. Okay? And these students prepare over an extended period of time, and they compete for about 10,000 seats, approximately. I mean, these are approximate numbers. That, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking off reservation seats and so on. So about 1 million students are competing for about 10,000 seats. 10,000 positions, which is roughly about 1%. Okay, uh, so many people say that uh, the ABC that drives Indian technology and you know Indian technological innovation is uh, astrology, Bollywood, and C. We can attach a lot of things. Okay, uh, one of the things that I want to attach there is coaching. Okay? So these these this coaching industry is extremely tech savvy. Okay, they are very very well connected. They are very fast on their toes. Before we know any policy decision, that means before it is communicated to the rest of the community that is directly affected, they have it on their hands. Okay. So they will come up with a strategy to attack almost any policy. So which means that any system that we do to sort of make that filter of JEE, where we pick 1% of potentially 10,000 applicants, uh, whatever system we do, there is this $10 billion industry trying to break it. So it's a very hard job to do. Okay. Now, if you, so, so one, one of the other things that one has to note is that students and also parents, the amount of effort that most parents put on this, on this exam is non trivial. Okay. Um, so, so they prepare from anywhere from two to five years to take that exam. There are students, there are advertisements in Bombay, for example, right inside IIT, which say six standard students will give you, will start you coaching, coaching for this. And that's ridiculous, but that's the way it is. Yeah, so, so this, the size of this industry is enormous. The stakes are very high. They want to break that system. But on the other hand, the IDs have been fighting very, very hard to keep it to the extent possible, as as clean as possible, or rather as uh, as unbreakable as possible, however hard that is. <coughs> okay, here is some 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 numbers that I am I am picking out from a recent uh, JE exam. Okay, so this is I think okay. I'm not very sure of the total marks, but I believe it is out of 450 because there are two papers. Uh, each with three subjects, and each each of those subjects I think were 75 marks. But let's let's take it whatever this this is. So this is the highest mark that that the the, the, the topper of the of the exam got this much marks. The 500 ranks are spread in about 100 marks. Okay. 
the next almost 2000 so this is about uh, this is less than 50 the next 2000 ranks are spread in 50 okay so just 50 marks so there are very elaborate rules which define how the rank is given so whenever there is ambiguity so there are fairly well defined rules okay now so so, so this is sort of the split so you can see that the topper is about 450 so the first 500 ranks have a 100 mark spread and you go down a little bit so it's already the the the, the number of marks that separates the, the for example the 500th rank and the 2500th rank is not very large anymore and we start going down you see that that number starts decreasing dramatically for example you see here that between 5000 5000 5000 and 500 for example 500 ranks are spread in ex just 16 marks okay we keep going down you see that sort of the last almost 600 marks are spread in about 16 marks so last 600 ranks are spread in about 16 ranks okay and the numbers don't don't change significantly if you look at these marks from year to year by the way this is public data this is not uh, th this is not private this is not private okay so the results are similar in the sense that if you take about if you take if you look at the last 2000 ranks that are declared the last 2000 rank people that are admitted into the into the program the spread of marks between that okay the, the spread of marks is is uh, is very very small okay um, so if I were to extra take this data and extrapolate it a little bit, okay. So, so what? So if I were to know how much marks separates out these 9,600 and the next, let's say 2,000, I would say it's unre it is not unreasonable to assume that it would be about 15 marks. I mean, I'm just taking it from the data. You can take or give a, a few more marks, okay. So I can ex I can extrapolate from that data and assume that the next almost 5,000 ranks. Sorry, the next 5,000 ranks are not separated by more than about 15 to 20 marks roughly okay and one of the things when you want to understand this data what you, one of the things that you have to know is that this is an examination taken by 17 or 18 year olds they have been preparing for it for as i said 2 to 5 years so there's an enormous amount of pressure on them the other thing is that it is taken in the peak of summer this is typically an exam during the last week of april or may in extremely trying circumstances so if you go to the centers i've sort of visited all these i've visited a large number of these centers where these exams are held they're in very very bad shape they're sitting on a stool with no backrest nothing okay in the in, in the middle of the summer sometimes the fan goes off so so the so the difficulty with which they write this exam the stra strain the physical strain with which they're writing these exams is also enormous okay so however hard they prepare so there is some noise that can always uh, so there is some noise that can always creep into the performance noise in terms of you know you, you just didn't get one or two questions right you didn't understand the questions forget even getting it right sometimes it's not it's not easy to understand the question because because the culture with, with that brings in the questions may not be ma matching with this with the students cultures you know if I talk about a car when a person doesn't know when I talk about a Ferrari for example when I don't know what the what the hell a Ferrari is it becomes a little hard I'm just giving you a bad example but roughly that is the kind of cultural differences that can creep in in these exams and small differences like that can kill can move you significantly up, especially if you are at the bottom of that table. Okay, so a small noise in the performance could have changed the rank significantly. Okay, so what we can so reasonably assume is that the next 5,000 that didn't make it into the JE system are probably compared comparable to the to the uh, comparable as the last 5,000 of those qualified. I'm I'm sort of stretching myself to prove a point, but I'm not too far off the mark. Okay? I'm just make, keeping the numbers a little bit more balanced. Okay. <clears throat> so that they're, they're comparable in terms of their ability and quality. Okay, that's that's sort of one can reasonably draw this conclusion from from the uh, from the data. Okay, so those five thousand that didn't make it to the JE, which are comparable to the last five thousand that got in, and a lot more would enter an engineering course somewhere in India. Okay, and this would typically be a college uh, affiliated to university or something that we call the NIT, okay, or the National Institute of Technology. <coughs> Okay, now mind you that those who didn't make it are fairly bright students. Okay, so they were they were, they could have got it, but they didn't. Um, again, because of bad luck or some 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 such uh, some such uh, some, some such incident on that particular day. Okay, it's just a one-day exam, by the way. Okay, so so since these are expected to be bright students, again, you would think it is not unreasonable to assume that they would probably a large fraction of these guys would probably go into the into a hot field, and computer science is as hot as it gets in terms of the demand for the for the string now they go through a four year curriculum okay um, 
and after four years they probably try to take the exam sometimes what happens is the universities are a little the examination system goes off kilter and they probably spend a, one more year and a large number of the and some of them also try to look for a job or, or do whatever they are still finding themselves in some sense and they finally decide to take the graduate aptitude test in engineering which is the gateway to the postgraduate program in India. <coughs> okay. Now one has to immediately note the difference between GATE and JE. JE is an exam that wants to select the top 1 percent out of almost 1 million students. The GATE exam is not like that. The GATE exam just wants to test your basic competence. It is an exam designed to know whether, designed to test whether you know the basic principles or not. It is a much simpler exam, okay? although it is a little bit more broad based. Okay? Uh, so, so it is definitely a much easier exam. Okay? And what one has to know here is the basic principles of a discipline rather than the complicated, the preparation for JE requires the student to know a lot of exotic and esoteric stuff, which the average guy does not know. The average guy will never know. Okay? GATE is not like that. GATE you have to just know roughly what you are supposed to know if you have got a decent grade in your curriculum. Okay? Now the other thing of course is that the exam is held in a balmier times that means it is held in February which is fairly cool and it is held in engineering colleges which means that the exam taking atmosphere is also much simpler so which I, which I can reasonably say uh, based on these two and the fact that most of these students are much older that the noise element is much less. So whereas JE is a fairly noisy exam, especially at the at the top, I, I I would be very uncomfortable making the same claim about GATE, primarily because of these reasons. Okay. So so we have so so we we have we have looked at a bunch of bright students who have gotten into the engineering stream, and now let us see how they do when they take this exam. And mo and what is important to note is that I'm now picking up. Uh, okay. So in this data that I'm going to do. I am going to show to you, I am going to pick, pick up the data corresponding to the students of computer science, which means there is a significant amount of selection done in terms of these are supposed to be the brighter students who come into the system okay, or who are taking this exam. Uh, and they, they also, the fact that they are taking GATE implies that they are serious about higher studies. So there is a further level of selection of the bright students who take this exam. So naturally, the I expect that the bias would be towards a higher performance. Okay. Bright students, motivated students, supposedly motivated students taking this exam. Okay. Now let me just give you statistics from 2011. <coughs> so about, about 136,000 students took this exam in GATE, in CS and this is the range that we got. Of course, the highest was very good, 95 out of 100 and this is an exam which has negative marking. So you are not supposed to guess. Uh, so the minimum was minus 20 and more surprisingly the average and both the, both the average and the standard deviation is just 12. Out of 136,000 the average marks, mind you that as I said earlier they are self selected in some sense. The average marks is just 12, and the standard deviation is also 12. That means it is, if, if, you, if you were to assume that this is Gaussian distributed for example, it is on, about only 35 percent of them have marks more than, 20, more than, more than 25. Okay. Now, usually what we do, what we do in GATE is that we sort of mark, we say that you have qualified GATE. Essentially what qualified means is that they are eligible for a scholarship from any of the MTech programs that the UGC recognizes. Okay. And the mark that is set for cutoff to call somebody qualified is usually at the mean plus the standard deviation. So that means about 30 percent of the candidates are declared qualified, okay. which means that a person with 25 percent marks qualifies this exam. 25 percent marks in my university or in any university does not even let you pass the course. Okay. And as, as I keep repeating, keep in mind that these are selected students. That means there is a self selection done, they are bright students from the beginning, they have motivated themselves to take this exam and then this is what has happened to them. Okay. Okay. Now again similar results from 2012, so the, the number that take this exam has been steadily increasing. I have been told that this year it is about 300,000. Okay, again, you know, ma market fluctuations significantly affect these things, uh, and uh, this was supposed to be a okay. This was supposed to be a sort of comparatively easy exam, so we have slightly higher um, higher uh, averages, and the standard deviation is also slightly lower. Okay, um, 
but if you want to see the, the uh, sorry it is not slightly it is a significantly higher average because the average here was about 12 and there it is about 21. So, these kind of fluctuations do happen in these exams primarily because I mean the, for a variety of reasons which still we, I do not think we understand them, but we are still thinking about them. Okay. So, again about 30 out of 100 qualifies in Bangalore University or probably VTU uh, sorry it is VTU now. So, in VTU 30 does not qualify you for even passing the course. Okay. And as I said earlier they, these are the top 10 percent of those that graduated approximately top 10 percent of those that graduated from the from the 12th standard curriculum in India. Okay. So, they have not been able to get get to this level. Okay. So, the mark distribution is also interesting if you want to just see how they how they, how they stack up. Okay. Uh, this is for this year only for 2000 only I picked it up only for 2012. Okay. Um, so, these are approximate marks because this is not public data. Okay. Uh, so, the, these are approximate numbers. So, between 90 and 100 there is only 1 sorry this should have been 100 and between 80 and 90 there is just 10. And if you look at it about two thirds of those that qualify or two thirds of those that are above 40 are sitting between 40 and 50. So, that is where most of the people are. Okay. Most of those that qualify get are. Now, I will give you one more statistic here. If you want to get if these guys want to get into IIT for an M tech they have to be somewhere within this range okay. and we interview them. I can tell you that is not a pretty pretty process. Okay. It is it's been it has been a it is it is a bit of a hard thing coming out of that interview and it is usually a depressing day for most of us. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is it's, it's a, it's a not really depressing day for many of us. Okay. Um, yeah, it is hard to keep off drink on that day. Okay. <coughs> it is about uh, 9 I think, 8 or 9 in that range. Yeah. And mind you that their uh, their life is subsidized inside inside IIT significantly. So, disposable income. It is less actually in IIT, it is about two and a half thousand is what I was told. So, that, that the disposable income part is significant. So, their lifestyle can be not really good compared to for example, those of their classmates who went to join join a job. Okay. So, the no commute, no nothing I mean they just have to come to classes. Okay. They do I mean most of those guys do. So, okay. <coughs> so which means that uh, about yeah as I said about two thirds of those are in the 40 to 50 range. Okay. So, which means that I can I would not be too wrong in concluding that something not very nice seems to happen them happen to them between gate and GE and gate. Okay, I don't want to sit down and sort of uh, use this forum to say what is happening to them. Okay, that's a uh, that's a separate discussion. Um, as I as I was saying earlier at IDB, we typically su st see students who get 60 or above applying for M Tech, and our experience with it. I'm not talking about those who get into the system. We select them. Okay, but I'm talking of those the average applicant that comes for the interview. It's quite pathetic. I am sure ISC does not have significantly different experience. Okay. And mind you that we are looking at people who are at the top end of this of this of this uh, whatever uh, of, of this list in some I sense. Sure. Yeah. On the which part? On which part? Right. Okay. No, I will come to that. I, I agree with you on that. I mean, uh, uh? yeah, I will, I will, I, I, okay, I, that is why I am only talking about JE and GATE. I am talking of those who took GATE exam. So, my, my, my conclusions are based on those, no, no, okay, let me repeat what I want to say. What I am saying is those who take GATE are interested in, are, are showing interest in doing research and coming for postgraduate studies. I am looking at them, I am looking at that sample. Because that is the sample that you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no. I'm, I, I'm willing to take this debate. I mean, you know, in the sense that I'm talking about those that want to do research. <laughs> no, no. I don't think anyway. I don't think I'm the anyway. So, okay. So, so let me just revisit the wish list that uh, PJ made earlier. Uh, so, the intake into the PhD program in the IITs and other such institutions is about 200. 200. That's roughly. I think if I just include most of these institutions, that's roughly the number. And less than, which is less than 0 0.04 percent of the 500,000 that enter. Okay, some may go abroad, some may look for jobs, etc. Uh, and we'll assume that about 800 of them extra, out of other 200 that join these places, 800 of them do a PhD eventually. Okay, so the claim is that that is still a small number. Okay, so it means that there is again, I repeat what I said that there's something between JE and GATE which drives them away from research. 
So it appears that something between J and Gates seems to turn them away from saying inquiring minds want to know. I mean, you may not like this, it like a slogan from National Enquirer, but what the hell? Yeah. So just for my sure. The, they are usually not counted here. Okay, that's a separate again. That's a separate statistic which I made. To just that's a separate anecdotal stati statistic which I'll give you later. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now that was the point I was about to make here. So roughly this kind of a change in the mindset is also evident in the IITs. I teach them. I've taught the first year students. I've taught the second year students. I've taught the third year students. I've taught the fourth year students, and I can tell you that the decline is exponential, literally. Okay. By the time they come to the final year, they're not ready to attend classes. I mean, they're just plain bored. Okay. Uh, what we do or what who does what is not is is not something that I'm an expert on. But the point is something happens. Okay. Uh, so so the first year, you know, you, you you teach them, you know, they're 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 really all over you at the end of the lecture. By the fourth year, you'll be happy to see them in class. That's roughly I mean the same batch, the same batch I have I've seen that transformation. Okay. <coughs> so this changing this fact that something seems to happen, okay, would require a serious and concerted effort from almost everybody, academia, government, industry. I'm, I'm not saying we are not to blame. I mean, I'm saying that everybody is to blame. I mean, there is something that is going wrong, okay? Uh, industry and society also, to some extent. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think it is that. I think it is just, I, I, anyway, I, again, I'll give you enough anecdotal evidence to claim that that is not probably true, again. I mean, it's not a significant difference in the quality of teaching between first and uh, and. Okay, I'm sure I teach extremely well, but that's not the point. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so just to summarize the preceding discussion, the students who can drive a strong research program are probably not there in large numbers yet. So this, I'm excluding those who go for a job because by that choice they have declared that they are not interested in pursuing research at this time. Okay. So this is possibly true around the world, but and not just in India. So this is something that I keep hearing from other other colleagues in other places also except in the really really top tier institutes okay <coughs> you get exactly so so but the difference though is the difference between us and 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 outside is that that maybe that the few that are there get sucked out more easily okay so the, the incentive for somebody who could have joined our program to not join and get out is is, is significantly high okay and at this time in india we cannot draw from an international pool yet okay hopefully hopefully that will change sometime in the near future, but at this time we, we are not able to do that. Okay, okay so just, uh, just to sort of uh, round it off in some sense, I will give you a little bit more. These are anecdotes and these are not based on data, these are based on some personal experiences. Now some of the things that I have noticed is that the meaning of research has not quite permeated into the education system. Okay, you, you, you talk to the average faculty member, I am talking of averages, so please do not assume that what I talk about is true for everybody, I am talking of the average 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 person in any, in any of these things. Okay? So this meaning of research has not permeated. For example, when, I, when we interview PA students for PhD and, uh, and, uh, and, and masters, I will give you two instances which are really, which sort of tell you a story. Okay? So there was once when I am interviewing a student for an M.Tech. Okay? So this guy comes and says, uh, and this, is, you know, this conversation is in Hindi, I can translate later. So he comes in and says, sir, I have written these two books. I have written these two books. He puts two fat books on my table. Okay, I'm literally verbatim saying what happened. Okay, so then you know that was the time when we were writing our first book, and it took us. It was probably into our third or fourth year of those six years that we spent on it. So I was asked him, how long did you take? Okay, the guy says three months. Okay, so I asked him how. I mean, how come you did it so fast? So the guy immediately says, the university has given me the syllabus. The textbooks were prescribed. All I had to do was mark these relevant portions from the textbook and hand it over to the printer. So, and he could write his name on the book and this is not this is not just dishonesty it is probably the person probably doesn't know that that does not constitute a writing of a book okay, there is there is a huge problem or communication gap or a cultural gap at that level i mean he was he was luckily not from any of the major institutions so so i guess i guess we are reasonably safe on that score at least the other thing we have noticed regularly is that if you see many people come and say look i published this paper so you pick out a paragraph and ask them to explain it. Immediately they'll start backing off, and you know that this is not a paper they have written. It's essentially what they call a pastiche of. That means they've taken from various papers, put together, and said, "Okay, here is a paper." Once again, it, I I probably believe that they do not know that that is not that does not constitute writing of a paper. It is it is not just that they're trying to actively cheat, but it is just that they probably don't know what it means to do research. Okay. 
So one of the other things that I think is happening is that the government and the other agencies seem to be setting fairly impossible goals with the hope of leapfrogging. And this muddies the water significantly. So I'll give you one example first. So it is now mandated that most uh, the PhDs, most faculty in all engineering colleges or faculty in the engineering colleges should attain a PhD. This has led to such a proliferation of extremely low quality PhDs, extremely low quality PhDs that it's, it's, it's becoming a very, very hard thing to handle. Okay. So the, the, the amount of, uh, I mean, it, the, the, the kind of things I've heard is like almost impossible to talk about in a public forum. It's that bad. So, so the government agencies, when they set 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 goals, things like you know five thousand or twenty thousand PhD students, etc., or PhDs in the next five years, we have to be very very careful. It doesn't happen. Leapfrogging is not something that one can do in these kind of things. Okay. Just to give you another sort of uh, another, probably something that was that was motivated by this. In two thousand five and two thousand six, this is from the AICT's annual report. They granted permission for eighty two new postgraduate programs in the country. So this is an organization that is supposed to evaluate every proposal okay, for and evaluate the proposer for the capability in terms of the faculty strength, in terms of other resources that they have to be able to perform research. Okay. This is an agency that is supposed to do that and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and they approved 82 new postgraduate programs and 78 new undergraduate programs, almost one in every two days. Okay. So, you know, I'm not going to draw conclusions. You can draw your own. In 2006 and 2000, in 2006-7, these numbers are 146 and 94, almost one for every working day. Okay, so this is the rate at which they are approving new programs. Okay, uh, yeah, and there's this notion of deemed universities. Again, if you look at the Espal Committee's report on this, you'll see the number again. I, and again, I don't want to elaborate on that. But the number of universities which have become deemed and the rate at which they are, ex they are, they are sort of increasing is also significantly high. Which means that there is, the only thing I can say is that the, the effort that goes into making sure that there is a quality is probably not quite there. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's sort of about the, about the policies, about two more slides I think. I'm just almost done. Almost done. Okay. Just to give you a quick overview of the research ecosystem in India in computer science. So there are about or computer science or computing related institutes. There are about probably 150 academic active researchers in academia. That's that might be you know slightly off the mark either way, but not significantly off. And about hundred more in the in the industry. Okay. So this this 250, which is probably on the I believe it's on the higher side, is for all areas of computer science, which means that the peer group is very small. Okay. So we don't have peer pressure among us to perform uh, or to do serious research. So, okay, and the peer the peer group is also very diverse in terms of both its expectations and quality and so on. So it is very easy for these groups to form comfort zones and not do a critical appraisal of the research of the peers. Okay, um, and not press each other. Sorry, there's some typo happened. And the absence of a strong peer group also uh, does not uh, ensures that there is no pressing each other for to perform and to innovate. <coughs> The other thing that I have observed is that attempts by large Indian corporations to set up research teams have also not worked very well. I mean, I can give you a couple of anecdotal examples once again, and uh, these these efforts are still having teething troubles. Okay, hopefully one at least a few of them will succeed soon. Okay, so it appears that we are still looking for a well-articulated at least uh, you know if you if you want to look at what is happening to to us around. So it appears that we are still looking for a well-articulated grand challenge problem that excites a large number of researchers. And for those of you who are old enough to know C dot. Okay, that was one of those days. It was, you know, the I, I, I was a graduating student at the time, and the atmosphere honestly was very electric in the sense that every one of us wanted to say, "Let's go to C dot." That was the kind of atmosphere it did. There was a grand challenge in terms of having to build this massive, these these switching infrastructures. There was success. There was a glamour. There was everything associated with it. So those days, I mean, the, I mean, and what C dot did to the Indian industry is is, is is fairly significant. Okay, and of course, CDAC, CDAC also grew up. In a very very similar atmosphere, so one fondly recalls those days. It seems to me that such days are not there anymore. And if you look at what C dot did, and if I look at the batch around my time that graduated out of several of these IITs, a large fraction of them went to C dot. They said, "I'm not going anywhere. I'm going here." And because they were there, the others also stayed back, significant amount of time, stayed back in, in India to do uh, to work in Indian companies and organizations. So those days don't seem to be there uh, at this time. So there is this there's this fuzzy. So it's some kind of a fuzzy period, I guess. So
So just to a few concluding remarks, so making graduating students interested in research needs to be addressed in a more comprehensive and measurable manner. I do not think we are doing a good job of it, but I think we have to do it soon. Okay, so we need a clear vision and a stamina to sort of see through that vision so that we can chart out a path and stick to that path. Okay, that is that I think is, is something that we have to start doing as soon as possible. We, I kept hearing even as I, as, as I was growing up and even now, so this notion of leapfrogging, we will move into the 21st century, 22nd century, etc. In, in leaps and bounds. So that I do not think happens. So these, these and setting unrealistic agendas will be very difficult to achieve. And one of the other things that I want to keep insisting is that averages are important. So every time you give out these difficult numbers, we always are given some outlier examples of who are outliers. So that is not what I am looking at. I know they exist. For example, if you look at IIT Bombay or the kind of students we get, they are spectacular students. There are several of them. But they are not averages. I am looking and what I am addressing here are averages. What is the average guy's capability or what is the average guy's output? Okay. So averages are important and they indicate the state of the majority. Where are the rest of them are indicated more by the averages and not by the outliers. And I strongly believe that demographic dividend which has to be reaped by averages and not by, not by the outliers. Okay. Uh, just a last pitch. So the ACM movie hawk, for those of you who are interested, since I saw a pitch for another conference, I thought maybe I will do a pitch on this one too. So ACM movie hawk is going to be held in Bangalore in August, July, August. So please plan on attending. If you do not want to attend, at least sponsor the program. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, if there are any questions. For the exploding and probably uh, very explosive talk. I don't know what that would. There is uh, quite a bit of realism in this, and I am sure that there are views which are not consistent with it. But the point is the reason why this talk was arranged, why this talk was taken was now we are talking about a billion dollar program, a yeah, 10 billion dollar program in India for the next five years. Who is going to contribute to it? Where are these people from? And if you take an average project of the dimension of a million dollars, a billion dollar means there are thousand projects. Where are these thousand individuals who can manage a million dollar project technically, then in terms of uh, even cash handling and so on. So I think <coughs> it was to point out that while we have aspirations in certain kind of things, it has to be matched with aspirations in human resources and many other things. And we seem to be completely out of step in these two. And it was mainly to point out this. And any future plan that we have for any significant growth in the next generation computing should very strongly also actually address the issue of the human resource. That is the point. Now, the details that we disagree, we will fight it out with um, uh, during <laughs> coffee. We are not allowing him to go to IIT Bombay today. He can only go tomorrow. So we will all attack him uh, in uh, whatever we think he's not right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, sure.